All right. Are we are we on right now? We're on. All right. Uh, so how you been? It's been a while since I've spoken to you. I've been good. I, I recovered from that eye infection or whatever that was going on last week and did a, quite a few number of things in the meantime. That Gaia Matrix book that you recommended is an excellent addition to my library. I love it. We uh, we followed we followed the um, the Arkham that he has laid out in New England, and I think I mentioned this last week that the root chakra is in basically my hometown. So then we followed the lineup to go to the sacral chakra and the solar plexus chakra this week. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. But enough with my stories. Well, I uh, hold on. I got a couple questions. I got a couple questions because I'm interested. So um, the the ley line that you were talking about last week and the week before, the one with the interesting name, what is that? The Hamanasset line. Yes. Yeah. Does that correspond to anything that you saw in Gaia Matrix? Well, not explicitly, which is even more exciting for us because it's like, okay, we're we're still the only people really l- working on this thing. Like other right, than Glenn right. Kreisberg, who wrote one chapter about it in his book, it seems like we're kind of innovating this research, which is exciting. And it's also very local too. You know how that feels when you can actually like drive to a place and 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 like you've read about it and then you can go and experience it. Yeah, and I would say that you know that's the only way to really do this sort of work is to do your own local stuff or at at least something which you could have feet on the ground. And I agree with you that it's exciting that it does. N- you have like another point of reference to go and uh, both your own personal explorations and investigations. And then the, um, I I don't remember the name you mentioned just a moment ago, the guy who first pointed out this ley line to you, but then seeing how it overlaps, because I don't, I don't necessarily know if anyone, you know, we're discovering this, we're, we're uncovering, we're, we're, we're rediscovering maybe uh, of saying it. So I'm, I'm finding this very interesting as well. And to hear how, your experiences now that you kind of have a general sense of of what to look for where to look uh you know what do you find mm. what do you experience so so i know that i for one i'm curious for that i didn't want to brush that over yeah i i think it's interesting <clears throat> how much information has come to the forefront and we'll get into that a little bit what we found when we when we went to Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, which is the solar plexus chakra on this uh, this arc home that Peter Shampoo lays out. And what what's interesting about Peter Shampoo or Peter Shampoo's work is all of his uh, ley lines are very circular. They're on a circular uh, and dodecahedral grid. So it's not what I expected. I, I just kind of from a very linear linear perspective thought of a ley line as one point connected to another point where he has you know multiple connections from each point he he's really creating these like grids based on like certain um positions that are significant obviously and then he has a map of all the ley lines and the Hamnasset ley line is not included on the on this map that has all the ley lines on the east coast so yeah it's 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 real interesting i mean i found yeah i'm not critiquing his work but um i know specifically like the the few references he makes to the susquehanna river uh he was slightly off in some of his details so to me, that's more so, it's like, you know, if you were to go and look at my work, you're going to see that I was probably off in some details. The things that I really focus on are probably more sharp, and I'm going to assume the same is true for him as well. Like, you know, his real hot button, his hot button wasn't the Susquehanna quite like it is my own. So it was easy for me to go and see that. So the, the point of, of me sharing that is, 
is saying how we take our own areas of what we really get into and we overlap and we begin to see these these broader perspectives, kind of like what you're describing with uh, the way which shampoo is is um, laying things out in these different sections, whether it's circular or dodecahedron, um, but then you also have your own. I'm pretty certain, uh, so he names a lot of the ley lines, and like I'm thinking right now, um, the, the uh, I think it's called the Peacemaker, the Peacemaker ley line, does that sound correct? Mm. I don't have the book in front of me. Yeah, he has like, the, uh, the Peacemaker ley is going through um, the Cape Cod to like Albany towards Niagara Falls. Right, right, right. And I believe that one may actually, that crosses over on Cooperstown, like right at the source. So I remember mm. noticing that on the map. But then he also makes reference to, gosh, I'm not going to be able to get the the phrase of it, but it's someone else's uh, mapping of Earth via different energy lines. And so um, you can see by by what he shares, like he's not indicating that, that what he's saying is the, the, the only system, which is, which is transpiring on earth, that there are other systems, which, which we can go and look and cross compare. And, and I think that looking at the human body is a nice way of thinking about it. We have all of these different systems. You've got your nervous system, you've got your circulatory system, your skeletal system, your muscular system, but they do all overlap to create that one human body, which, which you're experiencing life in. And so looking at that in terms of different systems or different, you know, energy lines or energy systems is a nice way, at least for me, it, it reconciles there being these different ways of looking at it. Mm. Yeah. And it's awesome that this book came up as a suggestion. I appreciate it immensely because like i said you know i had a very linear linear idea of this and he's giving us a sort of multi-dimensional model uh with the arcs and an arc is just a connection of different ley lines but he, he has a section in the book where it's like five or six blank pages chapter 20 where you're you're supposed to write or sh draw out your arc i thought that was Right up your yeah. alley for a book in my alley. Right, too. right. It was, uh, it was, the, the book is very much an invitation. Right. An invitation. He's like, hey, this is how I did it. Um, and then, um, you know, you recommend using that as a model for someone to find their own. And I would say that's very similar to what I do with the rights of the 40th parallel because not everyone's going to be able to go specifically to the Susquehanna river at the 40th parallel, but by looking at it, you can get an idea of how you can go and create your own model in your own backyard. And I think that's, that's the most exciting thing of all of this discovery work, which we're doing right now. Mm, right. And, and if I could even maybe finish the little story before we get on, cause I know you had a story that we left off on last week that I do not want to forget about. Um, oh, we're not going to forget it. Don't cool. you worry. Cool. So, so books in my life have played many different roles depending on what was going on, but I think they can serve as magnets. And the reason why I say that as it pertains to this week is the Gaia Matrix we grabbed it, we put it in the car as we were leaving to go to Derby, the root chakra on Peter Champois's arc home of New England. So Tara brightly is like, oh, let's bring the book. So we bring the book, we were going to Derby, uh, I think just to, just to go there because it was mentioned in the book and that's exciting. Well, we had the whole day ahead of us, so I'm like, you know what? Let's go to Bark Hampstead. So we drive up to the Sacral Chakra, which is about an hour, 45 minutes north. And it's this big, big, beautiful reservoir. We didn't end up even really going uh, to the water. We kind of just walked around in the <coughs> state forest. And we built a spirit portal. So you're probably like, what the? You built a spirit what? Spirit? what? <laughs> Walk me through your spirit portal. So in this... Uh, 
third book that we got, all about the stone structures here in New England, these authors lay out what the different names are for different stone structures you can find through New England. And whenever you see a very, very large boulder with another boulder next to it, and then rocks kind of piled in between, that's known as a spirit portal uh, within this archaeo astronomy sort of megalithic structures. As far as they go in New England, they have identified uh, a certain amount of, uh, of different types, but it's, it's called a split-walled cairn. Maybe it would be the more technical term for it, uh, but they call it a spirit portal. So we built this spirit portal just kind of out of stones that somebody had used for maybe like a makeshift fireplace, but it was a really interesting orange stone like this these big pieces of it must have been like some sort of granite or something um had iron in them and there was like a tinge of of kind of orange that they had and they're glowing in the sun so i'm like oh beautiful <laughs> the sacral chakra color is orange here's some orange rocks let's do something with it so we built uh sort of like a makeshift spirit portal on a smaller dimension we took the two biggest boulders that were there and kind of leaned them up against each other and then i just stacked the smaller rocks in between and on top of them and uh, left them there in this clearing and uh and yeah so you know that being said we we didn't really do do much ritual with that it was just a spur of the moment kind of fun thing to do because it was on my mind from this book well then tara's like you know let's go to shelburne falls and she wasn't really feeling good at people's state forest where we had built that spirit portal so I'm what like, do you mean not feeling well? Like we had to eat lunch. We, okay. we, we had, we had, uh, we had delayed eating. So she was feeling a little nauseous. So we, um, we went and found some food and then we're like, yeah, let's go to Shelburne Falls, which is another two hours or so north. So we're heading northward more and more. Um, well, long story short, we go for a nice, beautiful drive up through the hills you know, the, the leaves are changing faster up there than they are down here. So that was notable. We end up going to Shelburne Falls. It's a beautiful little Massachusetts town over the Deerfield River, which Peter Champois talks about being like a powerhouse river uh, because it has so many power plants that are connected to it. Um now, the, um, <clears throat> the town has what's called the Bridge of Flowers, okay? And we're just walking around, like, kind of nervous because it's pretty obvious that everybody's wearing masks, and we're like, oh, goodness, are we not going to be able to go in any of these stores because we don't wear masks, we don't have masks. It's just not a part of our protocol. Um, and some really nice people from the crowd, like, would – like just jumped out and talked to us they didn't have masks on i think they had one in their hand though and they're like hey do you know you know where uh what what they're serving over there at that restaurant it smells good so we chatted with them a little bit and it was striking like from so that. hold on let me let me pause you right now so i want to know a little bit more about these folks so you say they jumped out of the crowd what crowd are you talking about so this small little New England Shelburne town, you know, one of these streets that has all of the main buildings. Gotcha. So know? there's just like a bunch of people just walking around and milling around. Right. Families, majority were families. And, um, and yeah, just two people kind of sitting there looking around and they grabbed us. Were they us. sitting or were they, did they, yeah. were they sitting or standing? Okay, we were you standing. by them? We were standing. Yeah. And they were sitting. We walked by them, and they were like, hey, what's, uh, what is that restaurant serving? Because they noticed we They just start by. talking to you out of the blue. They right. just start talking to you out of the blue. And what are their ages, generally speaking? 50s, 60s, around there. Maybe a little oh. later. They, they both had graying hair, but they were not, like, elderly by any means. Okay. Are um, there other young people like you and Tara walking around? Uh, no. I mean, not unless they were with... Uh, 
it, it seemed like it was very family oriented. The, the, it was the, family oriented. Yeah. Okay. And so then this other couple who, who is sitting down, they're not wearing masks. They're a little bit of a different demographic. They strike up conversation with you. Correct. Right. And they, they asked us about the food. We said, Oh yeah, it looks good. And then they told us you have to go to the bridge of flowers. It's beautiful. Go check it out. And then they said, you know, Oh, and also go to the glacial potholes. So I'm like, Hmm. Glacial oh, so, pot- so, okay. So I'm going to take another step back. So these people are obviously local, right? Cause they know all the hot spots, or they've at least been there before. Right. We could say that. Right. And then they're asking you about the local restaurant. They're like, what's your opinion? Did you have like a bag from there? Is that how they, why they're asking you questions? No, they saw us leave the, the restaurant kind of Okay, just, so they saw you leave yeah. the restaurant. Okay, so that's the reason for why they would. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying, because this is like, it's, a, it's uncommon. Like anytime, like, you know, nowadays, like, you know, people will strike up conversation. I always see that as, is to me, like, that's a marker. That's why I'm asking all these questions and seeing, like, how strange it is. Like, do you guys look alike or something? Well, so, or unusual. we did kind so, of, we did, yeah, we, as a couple, we did kind of, because I'm very tall, and, uh, you know, Tara's not as tall as me, but she's not short, you know. And there was that same sort of height discrepancy between them as a couple. And we also ah. found out that they were they were both from, like, not Connecticut, but closer to Connecticut in Massachusetts. So they're like, oh, you're from Connecticut. Neat, you know. Um, and then they suggested right. that we go to these glacial potholes now. So they do that. So they pick up this magnetism with the dynamic of your of, of how you guys are. Like, just, Even if it's just purely like in this physical sort of sense, uh, they kind of have that. There's a drawing to there, and then they pass you on the insider information. They did, and we were aware. Right. We were aware of the glacial potholes, but we didn't know about the bridge of flowers. Okay. So, so we were kind of like, "Oh, cool, yeah, thanks, thanks for showing us where it was," and very polite and chatted with them for a bit. And we keep walking, and we're like, "All right, well, I guess we're going to the bridge of flowers." And this elderly couple, very like much older than the first couple that we spoke to, they're walking ahead of us, and something just ha- ha- like causes them to stop turn around and look at us and suggest crossing the bridge of flowers they're like you got to go to the bridge of flowers and we didn't even like we were a little thrown off by that because like wow okay two two random people we've never met before and then another two random people we've never met before suggesting that we do this let's go do it now uh so we crossed the bridge of flowers and it was it was nice you know it wasn't it wasn't an actual bridge made of flowers. It was just a bridge because um, that's what came to mind when they suggested it. I'm thinking like a woven bridge of flowers that's like, you know, made every year, something silly. But it was it was a walking bridge with just dozens and dozens and dozens of flowers planted along the sides. And we find out that this spot, Shelburne Falls, was a treaty site between the the Mohawk Indians and the and I'm gonna mess the, their name up, but I think it's the Picognacet Native Americans from Maine, or I, I'm mixing the the C and the G up, but it, it's uh, Picognacet and the Mohawk would meet here at Shelburne Falls for a sort of like a powwow treaty, you know, coming together uniting and and sharing fish and considering what tara and i have been researching about indigenous people it was really moving to find that out so and and also considering the glacial potholes which you know you showed us on the susquehanna river right so we go we go there with you in august or so and 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 got to actually experience and, and touch like what scientists are calling glacial potholes. And then here in Massachusetts, the same thing. All of these huge, I mean, this place was much bigger than uh, what you showed us in the size of the, the rocks, but the area was smaller. Like the rocks were, were much larger and the, the potholes were very deep. Um, what type of stone was it? It was, it was, it must have been the same type of stone. I don't I don't know off the top of my head, but it was it was really interesting. 
it was different in the sense that it, it had different coloration. You know, the stuff we saw on the Susquehanna had more of a, like a uh, beige, slate, gray kind of look. Whereas this stuff was very, it almost looked like it was painted. It had like deep reds and, and, and tans and yellows and it was getting late. So the color qual like contrast might not have been as good as it was in the bright of day, but yeah, it was very interesting, but they have it all fenced off. You know, you can't climb on them like we did when we were on the Susquehanna river and there's this big blinking yellow light on top of the dam because they have the water and the water is the water level is enormous it's like brimming over this wall dripping onto the the glacial stone so you can imagine like if they didn't build this dam right here you know you wouldn't be able to see these glacial uh potholes uh they would just be underwater you know so they they built this dam and they're kind of diverting the water away from the glacial potholes so people can see them, I guess. That's the idea. And But maybe also to prevent eroding, to preserve them as long as possible. Um, but it, it was just interesting how the dam, you know, had such a presence there. It really took the magic out of the space. And, and I wouldn't maybe not have had that ability to compare if I hadn't gone to the Susquehanna and experienced it there, but there too, they have that dam and the nuclear plant mm -hmm. not too far away. So it was a curious connection. And then, you know, we, I'm kind of skipping over a point cause we saw the glacial potholes after we crossed the bl bridge of flowers and at the edge of the bridge of flowers on the other side of the river was a little bookstore. And in that bookstore, of course, we found a book called The Manitou Stone that gets into everything that has to do with the sacred stones here in New England. So it's just it was just so awesome that one book brought us to this next book which is giving us even more details. And and this bookstore, I mean, it was a hole in the wall and they didn't take credit cards, you know. So it was it was definitely like one of those things, man, where that one book called to us, the Manitou Stone. So that's all I have for now, but it was just interesting the A the connection between the Susquehanna and the Deerfield River with those potholes. And then be this like continuation of the the mystery unraveling via books and these different authors kind of just jumping out at us from the shelves. Definitely. I'm, I'm looking at images of the potholes right now and seeing how they're similar and how they're, they're different. They don't look like they're the same type of stone as the Susquehanna ones, but they're potholes nonetheless. And the fact that they have it all, um, uh, barricaded off, you can't go there anymore. That's that's a little bit, um, I would imagine, disappointing if if you're there physically, you can't walk on them. Well, uh, it's it's, you... it's it's dangerous to walk on them because of the dam. Like the water right. level is like it's like brimming over this wooden wall that they have blocking like eight feet of water. So yeah, God forbid that wooden wall broke, it would just be a you know deluge and knock everybody off of those rocks. So yeah, it's it's with good reason. But I mean, I, I imagine before the dam was built, people could walk right onto the rocks just like we did and fish from them, or maybe even catch the fish that get stuck in those little potholes. Yeah, yeah, that that's definitely interesting. Were you able to get um, like uh, any stones to take with you from that area? No, not from that area, but what was really cool was as soon as we pulled into Shelburne Falls from whatever, like, large road we were taking, we noticed that the road goes right around this mound, and I'm looking at this mound, and I'm like, that's a mound. Like, there's trees growing on top of it. It's not just some, like, highway earthworks, you know. It, it's a, it looks like a mound, you know, there's, and the trees, the way they were planted on top of it, it was all road. It just, it just seemed very strange and, you know, just tipped my instincts to say like, that's a mound. So 
I think we mentioned a couple episodes back when Tara and I went and visited the Scaticoke Nation. We gave them some pyrite. We left them pyrite on the uh, on their signpost. Well, we took the Apache tier that we bought that day, and we left it at the mound. So, no, we didn't get any rocks, but we did leave uh, some minerals Good. behind for our sort of... Uh, anchoring good energy in these places that's sort of the the thought behind it and also gathering water too so that we can alchemize the the energy of the water right this kind of came to us last night under the full moon like we have all this water we've been gathering from different rivers and those water those little the bottles of water are like a living record of the energy of each river um, so I, I think part of our, what we are being called to do is to transmute that bad energy that the river might be carrying to good energy and then just give it back to the river, pour the water back in and see what kind of effect it has. Well, uh, can I comment on that for a bit? Cause I think there's a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's link this back to what you were saying with the, the spirit portal that, um, the very specific conscious spirit portal that you built at your first stop. Where was that? That was at? It was in the People's State Forest in Barkhamstead, Connecticut, and it's the sacral chakra within Peter's arc home of the, the chakras of New England. So what I, I would, I, I, if I'm listening to you tell these stories and of, of your adventures, I would... Um, from my point of view, is expand that definition of where and what is the spirit portal that you're creating. Because I see all of these different sort of activities as being connected to that. And so whereas, yes, you are very conscious and specific building between the boulders at the, the people's forest, um, the intention, whatever that act, was doing your it's all part of the same sort of um this adventure that you two are on uh definitely including the the, the Sh- it wasn't shelby falls was it shelby falls what was it i i wouldn't be surprised if locals call it that but it's shelburne falls but, shelburne yeah. shelburne falls so like shelburne falls is is obviously like that going crossing the bridge um Going, finding the book and what that book was telling you, uh, going to the potholes, like that was part of this experience, undoubtedly, because it happened on the same trip. But then expanding it in terms of of every, all of the different outings which you and Tara are doing. Like, you know, this is, that's a much greater, if you will, like kind of a, um, a spirit portal. Um, so keeping that in mind, like every time you're doing something with the stones, every time you're having an experience, like, seeing that you are adding to it. And if I were you, I would even, I would begin to maybe start mapping where you, where you create these places and start to see, see what, what is unfolding the area, the geological area, the geographical area, excuse me, not so much about like the minerals of it, but just like the spatialness of like what you're doing, because there seems to be this action, you called it like alchemizing the water. I'm seeing it more so is you're creating feedback, feedback webs uh, through your own consciousness and through the land itself by bringing uh, stones from one place to another, by having an intention, by having experiences, by meeting with people. But then the, the, um, what seemingly the payoff for you as a human being and as an individual living in your body is like, you get these books, like that is, that's the mechanism for you. And like, you get these like little, these little, uh, uh, next clues, which you are incorporating into this, this, this story, which is unfolding, which is your life. And, you know, whether that be, 
uh, the couple of hints you got from me about, or from me and someone else about the Gaia Matrix, but then also the specifically like all of the used bookstores that you go into and finding that one book, whether that be the history of, of Susquehanna County or whether that being of the stone, you know, it's all connected. And so you're, you're creating something, you know, we don't know what you're creating, but we're, <laughs> we're going forward with it. And it is happening outside of, of or or maybe said a little bit more accurately l- more outside of the loop of the the technosphere mm. you know you're not doing this through like maybe you're using like the gps to get there so there's part of you which is experiencing it but you're going out of it and you're having real experiences with real people uh you know really noticing the peoples who you're connecting with like you know there's a magnetism like maybe some of those people are um, awake enough to know that they're participating in something and they're looking for you as much as you're looking for them, or maybe it's just happening or more of a, on a, a, a subconscious type of level, but without a doubt it's happening. You're running into people. And so like this, this is the, this is the story, which I see, which is, which is happening. Mm. It's, it's uncanny too. Cause like the day before Tara will attest to this, the day before I was telling her like, you know, it's really interesting. You've been in new England, Mike, I'm sure you, and I'm sure you've seen these in Pennsylvania too. I don't think they're exclusive to new England, but new England is famous for these stone walls on people's properties, but they're not just in people's properties. They're everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're, they're on mountains. They're in river valleys. They're in strange forests that nobody's ever built a house in. So I've, al- I've always thought the traditional explanation for these stone walls was flimsy. You know, like, oh, well, they were built by colonialists. They were built by Indians. That's it. Nothing more. Well, the day before, Tara and I were just kind of driving, and we saw some interesting stone rows. And I'm like, see, that's what makes me question this whole thing. Look at those. I'm like, who would put them there? You know? And she's like, huh, what? And I'm like, I'm getting a little frustrated, and, and she's frustrated probably twice as much because I can be a real jerk sometimes when I'm trying to explain myself. Um, and, and yeah, so I basically... Um, I'm like, I just put it out there like, well, I don't know. I just don't know, but it's cur- it's very curious. And then like chapter three of this Manitou book, they address that and they say, well, we don't call them stone walls. We call them stone rows because it seems like there are rows and rows of these stones all along New England. And I don't believe the book makes this connection, but what came to mind for me was the Naztec lines. And, and given that we're looking at ley lines and the arc home and it's all sort of bird's eye view type stuff, what if these stone rows that New England is so famous for, what if they used to function uh, in a similar way to the Nazca lines or, you know, something to that degree? I mean, that's a really interesting idea. Um, and you're calling them rows, R-O-W-S, correct? Not R-O-A-D-S. Yeah, R O W S. Yes, R R O W S. There's another word for them. I don't know what it is, but I remember seeing a video, um, a video of all of them in not all of them, but a, a collection of these unexplainable rows, walls, um, and other the uh, other stone formations, but all in Pennsylvania. And the locations were not, they were, they were not told because they didn't want people to go out and find them. But, uh, this idea of the Northeast and these unexplainable walls, which are often just written off as from colonial times, but seemingly that's not the case at all. And sometimes they have trees growing from them that are easily 600 years old. So that, that throws that theory out. And then the other thing that's strange is you see this a lot in Connecticut. There are megalithic boulders, like boulders that look like they're three or four tons that are used in these stone walls. It's like, okay, how many oxes did they tie to that stone (laughs) and how far did they drag it there? If that's the explanation, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Like, uh, and you asked the question, um, who put this here? 
Uh, and the question that popped in my mind is you're describing is like, why did they put it here? And like, you know, all of these questions, like, you know, it's not like one is, is better. It's like looking at it from all of these different perspectives to like try, try to get a, a, a better understanding of what is this, what is the nature of this land and of this reality? Um, which I think, uh, bef- is, is providing a good segue to where I want to go and start going into some of my stories. If that's okay with you, unless there's more to add. No, yeah, let's uh, let's let's leave that for uh, next time because there isn't much more to add and there's a lot more to discover. So yeah, I'm curious to to know what we left off from last week. I'm sure the audience is like, wow, oh, Mark took up the whole episode with his damn bird story. We didn't even hear Mike's story. We've got plenty of time, so but I'm not I'm not going to start with that story. I'm not going to start with that story uh, because that was I don't know ten days ago, and a lot has happened. So I'm going to start with something a little bit more recent, and then move back to that. And it is complementary to what your work is, but from the inverse, the inverted um, perspective. And I'm talking about false realities and really the discovery of false realities because I think that it's not it's not so much um, so much about discovering the, the like a, a baseline reality or a deeper reality or even another reality but uh, in this land that we are experiencing life within I think it's more so about eliminating the false realities I don't think it's so much like we have to discover anything as much as we have to remove the blindfolds the consciousness and perspective of what we're looking at so that's what I mean by false realities I'm going to point out some strangeness which I'm seeing in false realities and I think by understanding the false realities it also helps us get more to what you're describing, which seems to be more um, authentic. So that being said, that being said, I want to go. This is this is really just yesterday. The story which I'm going to tell you right now is yesterday, but my mind has been swimming in it ever since since it happened. So I was uh, on my weekly call with Emily yesterday doing uh, the glass feed game or maybe it's project kids. I don't even know what the name of our show is. We've got two shows. All I know is we record every Tuesday at 10 a.m. That's all <laughs> I know. I just show up for that. So that being said, we're talking about a whole bunch of different things and it was, I don't even remember what, what the trigger was, but within our conversation, it became, um, it became appropriate for me to go back to Google Earth, Google Street view of my house where I'm living right now. Okay, and you know what I mean by by Google Street View, correct? Yeah, yeah, I imagine most okay. people do, right? You you click on the little yellow man, and then they you stand right, the right. Yep. You move from so what what the Google Maps or Google Earth does is it it'll show you kind of like floor plan looking down at at you know the land and then google street view it puts you in from a different perspective but it's the same thing so the reason why uh i i like to look at google the google earth and google street view they they are immensely valuable but you have to go into it or i recommend you have to go into it realizing you know this is information which is coming from you know the google system that level of reality, whatever that is, like you just have to take that in consideration, you know, with everything that you say. There's lots of good stuff, you know, there's a lot of gold nuggets to be found within it, but then, you know, you also have to be a little bit uh, aware of, of who you're getting this from. So that being said, uh, about a year ago, I, when I first looked at the street view of this house, which I'm living in, I noticed that from street view, that there is a split. There's a split right in the front door of my house. And what I mean by split, so I'm, I don't know how they do Google Street View. Like I don't understand the technology or the computer processing, but you know, I can, I can make some pretty 
okay assumptions. Like, you know, you can take your, your smartphone and, and do that panorama view where you, where you open up the, the, the aperture and you scan an area and somehow it's able to process what, what is seen into one image, right? Like we see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm assuming that when they create the Google Street view that it's something similar to that, that I've seen the Google cars. You've probably seen the Google cars. They probably have a variety of cameras or like a camera device, which is pointing maybe 360 degrees, or maybe it's like in the four directions and like up and down. And it's just driving through. Like, I don't know if they're told where to drive, but somehow like all of that data is then processed in such a way that it creates the Google, um, the Google street view experience, probably similar to like, however, like virtual reality works when you wear those goggles that wherever you lift your head, you can see up, down, right, left, or so forth. Um, so the reason I'm going into that is when I see the split, the split on my front door. And so what it is, is it almost looks like it's double. You can see, um, what would normally be the door, like let's say the equivalent of 36 inches, maybe the door opening is 36 inches. That happens twice. So it appears to be like, let's say 72 inches. The inches I'm just uh, are not shown in Google Earth. I'm just saying that to give people an idea. Like it looks twice as wide as it is. You could tell there's something off. And so my, the part of my brain which looks at um, – that looks at things from a very, very like mundane uh, uh, Occam's razor. Like, let's get to like the most uh, simplistic explanation for for this occurrence. Like, I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's where the scene takes place. Like, somehow, like that's where the processing happens, where they sew together, they weave together these two different images, and it was slightly off, you know. Um, so I'm thinking that's what, what's happening. But that never really quite made perfect sense because if that were happening, that split, that scene where you're kind of seeing double should be encompassed in the entire image, meaning like the sky should show that or a tree should show that. The, the images in the background behind the house should have that same sort of uh, – seeming that seem happening but but that wasn't the case and in fact like there are a lot of things that don't really make sense it's like well if it was just done through technology it would it, you would see other sort of clues you know see that there but then maybe it's, it's from because they're using different different cameras i don't know i'm open to all of that but then the other the other thought is you know, the other thing which I had been open to, and, you know, and I, I, I did a video about this. So you could see a video I made a year ago where I talked about it. I'm doing it kind of like in a fun, playful way because I don't know. But in a fun, playful way, I'm like, you know, this is Google picking up. Like there's, a, there's, a, there's a tear. There's a tear in reality, which is in this house, which is, you know, it kind of makes sense, you know, based upon all of the strange things which have occurred to me in this house and just my own way of how I perceive reality. I'm like, yeah, that would make sense. This is, this would be at my front door because this house, you know, how I was called into it. So all of that being said, so I've seen that before. I've talked about it. I've made videos. And yesterday I go and I'm talking to Emily. And I wanted to go and look at that again. And I go back and I look yesterday. And guess what? It wasn't there. They patched it? They fucking patched it. They fucking patched it. <laughs> and so, so this is where it gets really interesting. Because I told you, I'm trying to go and... Um, and be as I don't want to jump to the most furthest out there explanation because there's, you know, I say this with quotation marks around it. There's a danger to that. Like, you know, this wanting everything to be, to be like wild and mystical. And on a certain level, everything is wild and mystical. Like how the hell are we here? But a lot of it's not. So like, I want to always begin with like the most plausible explanations. And if I can reduce those, then I can more comfortably step into like the, the weirdness. And, um, when I was looking at that 
seeing in that split, one of the things which you are able to do with, with Google Street View is you can rotate 360 degrees in what you're looking at. You can rotate like horizontally, look in the, the direction behind you, but you can also do it vertically. You can look up at the sky above you. Um, and what I noticed by going up and down the street in front of my, my house, that there appears to be whenever the Google car had passed another car is where you would see a double. Because I could look behind my door and there was a car passing and I could see a little bit of that scene double. But just like uh, with the house behind that car, there is no scene. So that is happening, but that's not universal with Google. Like I could go and look in other or, uh, other places outside of the street in front of my house where you're passing cars, and there is not that that double that double vision sort of effect. So it's not a universal uh, thing that happens every single time they use their cameras. Maybe there's something off with the camera. I, I don't know. But that being said, so what what I just yesterday when I first saw that it had been patched on my front door I immediately rotated I rotated the view so I could look in the opposite direction where there was a car passing and there was still the scene there or there was still the double there so the only place that it was patched was on my front door so then I kept on exploring all of this a little bit more and I remember very, very clearly when I was making this video and I first discovered that there was that, that double, that split on my front door, that when I rotated behind, on the opposite direction and I could see the car that was behind it, you could actually see the human being who was driving it. And what you could see was a double of their elbow, which was sticking out of the window. They were resting their arm out the window, and the elbow was pointing out of that. I just remember that very, very clearly that I saw that of that individual. And when I looked at, when I looked this time, like yesterday, at the car which was opposite the door, it was a different view. I could not see the elbow. I could see the, like, it was like the car was kind of past. It had driven past it, and I could see the back end of it. It was on the back end is where I saw that double vision sort of thing. So how Google Street works is you're at a particular location, and if you move your cursor forward or backward, you'll see, like, an arrow up here, and you click on that arrow, and it moves you forward or backward, wherever that that arrow is that you're clicking on it. And it is, it's seemingly that you could go and nudge up uh, in as small as increments as you could possibly click. So like a foot forward, 10 feet forward, 20 feet forward, but it doesn't work that way. So you can move your cursor, like what appears to be a small amount of space forward and click on it. Um, but it's going to bring you to the same location of viewpoint as if you moved, had your, 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 your cursor moved a little bit forward. So what I'm saying is there seems to be embedded in the technology, though it seems like you can click at any sort of spot to have your 360 degree view, there seems to be like just limited nodal points which you could click on. You could click anywhere, but it's going to bring you like 15 feet or like a, a consistent amount of space. So where I'm going with all of this and what, what seemingly has happened is there was just one of these spots, one of these like locations where you could spin around and look which that split on my front door was visible. And from that location is where I saw the double elbow. That location that one, like, I don't know how they would identify it. Let's say there's a specific, like, you know, uh, marker within the program that makes Google Street View and Google Earth. That has been eliminated, which is why I was able to still see uh, um, some of the double visions or scenes, but the one specific viewpoint in which I can see my front door where I was able to see that split before, that is gone. That is out of Google Street Earth. And so the question I have for myself is like, well, why would that occur? 
Why would that have been taken away? Was it because I put so much energy, like just mental energy, conscious energy, looking at it, talking about it, broadcasting about it, that maybe the algorithm itself like fixed it by taking away that maybe the algorithm hit it. Maybe it didn't even happen. I don't know. But I know that there is a record that I've discussed it. I have screenshots of when I took it before. You can look on Google Street View. It tells you the date in which the image was uh, taken. Uh, for me, it was August 2019 was the ones where it was split in front of my house. Um, that has not changed. But I'm, I'm left with, with these questions right now, the questions which I'm asking myself, and they're kind of rhetorical because I don't know that we can actually answer them, is why would that change? And then also going back to, I said, false reality, like, you know, creating the, the, the Internet and particularly Google and all of the, the top level platforms, Google, Facebook, uh, uh, Instagram, all of the top tier platforms, which most people are understanding uh, their reality through, um, you know, are they, this is where false reality first is, is created, at least through the, the technosphere. So that is, that is where I want to begin this journey. I, I talked a little bit. I, I don't know if I was able to articulate this thing verbally as, as well as I could if we were looking at it visually right in front of it. But I want to hear what your thoughts are, uh, any sort of comments or clarification uh, before I go on. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm definitely able to visualize i remember middle school when google earth came out and we would go to computer class every day and that was that was what me and my friends would do we wouldn't we, we wouldn't like play there was like four or five websites you can go on back in those days and play little like uh i forget what they're called exactly but i think something bit games you know, they're just like simple little games that you can play on a desktop. Well, me and my friends would always go to Google Earth and just explore because Google Earth came out in 2007, I think, or 2005. So we were using it around then. And I remember finding all sorts of odd things on the map. And just, you know, at that age, not really having a reference to be like, that's strange or that's not strange. Uh, but definitely noticing things that seemed like they belonged in a video game and not on a representation of the real world. So I've always I've always been a fan of of Google Earth in the sense I like I've used it I've I've grown with it and you know when you mentioned the the GPS earlier as one of the tools maybe the only uh, technosphere tool that we use on our journeys. It is it is very useful. I mean, the whole Hammond Asset line we're able to map out thanks to Google Earth, and we can you know add a point here and then trace that point to another point on the map, and then we have that line that we can look through. So, but as far as the street view goes, I remember looking at my house and not noticing anything, but then I remember looking at like the the bird's eye view of my old house and I was a little alarmed at the level of detail like they they knew where my dad's shed was they knew where our pool was and we have a pretty heavily forested backyard I was surprised that they were able to get that level of detail with their their satellite but yeah other than just a couple little ramblings I don't I don't know it's strange it's strange Mike I, I think the <laughs> the portal the portal is being opened up over there where you live, whether Google catches it or not. Well, well there, there, there's something. And the, the, the Google Earth, and it's been a while that I've done this research. So I'm going to go off, the, off my best memory. So Google Earth was, was a the, – the original technology was from a company called Keyhole, I believe. And the guy who started Keyhole was, was straight up like um, like a very very obvious connection to to the CIA. Um, like I think if you read his bio, like you know he 
has a degree in foreign service or diplomacy, like one of these like uh, uh, overlapping sort of words for for intelligence agencies, you know, diplomacy and intelligence, they tend to go hand in hand. And, and then like everything about it just kind of screamed it. Um, and there, there was also a connection, I can't remember, um, MapQuest. MapQuest was, uh, MapQuest is headquartered, or at least at one point was headquartered in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the MapQuest technology is used with it as well. So the, 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 all of this has very much like, you know, its groundings. All of our technology is groundings in either uh, straight up Department of Defense or intelligence networks or mm-hmm. intelligence uh, uh, um, in te- uh, technology development. Um, and then what exactly is the depth of the, the intelligence world? You know, I don't know that answer to it, but I certainly think it's much more complex than what we think it is. But, but we're dealing with something, and it's very much about, about, real, about creating reality and, and creating, um, I mean, that famous quote of, by who is the, the, the head of the CIA at the time. Well, no, we completed our, our – um, our uh, disinformation campaign when no one knows what is true or false. You know, that's basically you're talking about consciousness. You don't know what's real and what's not real. Um, it's always been about that. And we look at cybernetics and all of these sort of things. It's, it's always computers and always technology has been about like, you know, creating these certain false realities that, that are so encompassing they feel real through feedback loops. Um, so that's what I'm finding so interesting, like this this comparison or the, that we're doing right now between this kind of yours and Tara's feet on the street, like opening portals and like playing around with that level of reality. And as I'm doing this studying on this, what I'm going to call like a layer of false reality, but it's become it's become a real reality like we really do use google earth it is really like a an accurate description on like how we get around through cities and places like that but then also having an understanding like you know it's it's also given to us by uh organizations that we should at least be um should not accept 100 percent without any sort of question so we're, we're we're definitely working that's why i said we're i'm look coming at this from this the same thing but from an inverted perspective uh mm. and they feel that they are in um they're in they're in they're in harmony even the fact that it sounds like what you're doing is opening up these these portals if you will and if anything i'm going to suggest that i close one down like at least i close down the one that's led through google mm. for better because or it's worse gone. Right, right well it's just like you know so let's go back to these different sort of systems um these different the, the I talked about like you know the skeletal system and the and the, the 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 circulatory system. We have all these systems in our bodies and they integrate and they work together to create this unified experience of being alive in a body. And then and then I, I paralleled that to um, to like different systems which we could think of energy channels within Earth, whether those be like, you know, the the ley lines described by shampoo or looking at like whatever currents are within flowing water or or the the lines which you're discovering, like, you know, how they're all coming in. Well, I'm gonna suggest that what we're seeing with with the you know, I'll use Google Earth as an example, but it's generally true with all technology, is it is this insertion of a false system into something else, which is, or, or an artificial, an artificial, and I'll define artificial by saying not naturally occurring. You know, it's something you got to build. You could theoretically, I mean, this is where we're getting into nuance here, because theoretically you're building something with the movement of rocks with like, by, by bringing water from one, from one river to another river by doing all of those sort of things. So yes, you're, you're, you're constructing that. But that's a little bit different than constructing something on 
the technology level where you have to go and mine the earth and slave labor to create the products and the routers and the hardware and then write the software and all of that. So it's a little bit different, but I, I do want to point out they they both are they are artificial to a degree in the fact that they're not naturally occurring without human interference. But that being said, the computer system, the, the technosphere, it has been inserted. It has been inserted into this other, you know, this baseline or more naturally occurring reality, and it's done very, very well. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an accurate representation. And our consciousness, you know, the human beings, you know, who, you, who are encompassed in, you know, both from electromagnetic fields of, of these wireless networks to actually how we're going about our lives. Like let me go and do my online banking and let me go to my GPS to find out where I need to go. And let me go and write my diary by doing my daily description of my life on Facebook. Like, you know, that has become the intermediary of your life. You're, you're, you're putting your life energy through that. That is real. That's really happening. And there, it has been, it has been woven into, it has been what, you know, if you've ever heard the term, the term astroturf, you know, the, the technosphere has been astroturfed into the, the natural baseline reality. And then it's kind of becoming more and more seamless for our experience. Mm. As you do the type of work which you and Tara are doing, and that's not the only type of work. Anyone who's kind of going out in the real world and, and using their intuition and imagination and doing hands on, like they're, they're doing it as well. Um, they are recreating connections outside of that intermediary. Um, but then what I'm going to, what I think I, I, I'm witness, what I have witnessed by seeing that, that slice go away, whatever that slice is. And I do think that it probably is pointing at something. Uh, I collapse that. I think I collapse that. I collapse that belief. I, I would agree. I think if anything, the Google, a Google portal couldn't handle all the truth that you're shelling out over there, Mike. Well, that, that the, I would suggest that's, you know, that's a big part of what all of these, uh, all of these portals are. These portals are gateways, you know, from one, from one realm to another. And by definition, they have to be limited. They have to, like, you know, you, you can't let everything through. And so what you're calling truth at the very least is like a story that doesn't fit the narrative. Mm, right. And so, you know, that's what, that's when we see these collapses. And so uh, that was the first story, which I wanted to, to kind of share with you. Um, any more comments or questions or, or, or anything along those lines before we move on? Well, I don't want to dox you or anything, but it is curious that this is going on given what they're building across the street from you. I remember last time I visited you, you mentioned they were building some kind of, uh, you know, super tech school or something like that over there, right? That's exactly right. Like I, uh, I mean, the whole, the whole nature of, of where I live, you know, both how. I've lived in this house for, I moved in in December 2019. So I moved in three months before the lockdown and how I had absolutely no plans on moving. I was, li I was very happy with where I was. And then just like some things came up and, and so I moved there. Had that not happened, I would have been stuck in a place which would have been an absolute nightmare to be in for the last couple of years. Mm. Absolute nightmare. So it was like, you know, there was that and there's all sorts of, other strange synchronistic sort of things that happened. Um, um, so I see that as for me, when I look at my own life, I'm like, okay, this is what, for whatever dictates, for whatever, whatever dictates like, you know, synchronicity or life, whether that's like, you know, someone playing games or whether that's like, you know, versions of myself leaving clues to myself, you know, whatever that may be, I don't know. But I feel comfortable and satisfied in looking at, at saying that whatever those forces are, that was what moved me to this particular spot as opposed to any other spot I could have possibly move. And so that has to include all parts of where, where this house is. And this house is located, like, as you said, directly across the street from this, 
this high school, which is undergoing like a $200 million upgrade and to turn it into like one of these science, technology, and engineering magnet super schools, whatever you want to call it. So that is happening like literally across the street in front of my house and then directly behind my house uh, is 500 feet away. And the yard is, is, it's an unusual yard. Like no other house in this neighborhood kind of has a yard like this. Um, There's a 5G tower. So I'm like squeezed in between these two things. And it's like this little, it's this little wooden wonderland, which, (laughs) which, which I'm finding myself, which feels like a split in the matrix. Right. Yeah. On that level. Yeah. It's, it's like the, uh, you know, this kind of comes from paganistic thinking, but there's like the idea of the crossroads, you know, where two things meet. It seems to be a, uh, you know, any transitory place has some energy associated with it. And that's, I mean, that's what that sounds like. Two tech hubs with a very nice strip of natural trees and, and, uh, organic energy flowing in between it's yeah and like historically the location where i am um you know if you go in and if you're listening to this at home and you you type in uh manor township pennsylvania uh indian archaeology you'll see that this location is where uh it all began because this was such a important location to at the time the Susquehannock. They lived right here. Like this land was where, where, where the most powerful tribe of the Northeast, you know, of people. This is where they lived. Mm. You know, so this land, this land is 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 charged, if you will, no matter how you want to go, and 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 define it. So yeah, I, I'm just the latest person who gets to to be here, and I'm here during this particular time having the conversation with you. Right on. All right. So so let's go move on to what I was going to talk about last week. Should we do that? Cool. Yeah. All right. So so last week I was going to describe. Excuse me, I'm walking in the backyard. I was down in the basement, so now I've gone outside. So I was going to describe um, a trip which which Jenny and me and the girls we took down to uh, to uh, Williamsburg, Virginia. Right. This was two weeks ago. So how familiar are you with Williamsburg? What do you know about Williamsburg, if anything? Uh, well, I know it's a colonial sort of hot spot. Like. I remember when I used to watch TV, you'd see the occasional Williamsburg commercial where they like, you know, shoot off the muskets and everyone's dressed up in revolutionary garb. And it's, you know, one of those very similar to what they have up near me. I think it's like a Shaker or Quaker village and they take kids to it for the like middle school field trip we went and we saw what life was like in colonial times Sturbridge village is what it's called in massachusetts but it reminds me of that uh just from what i've seen but never been uh down there myself so i I can't say i I know for sure but yeah that's my impression so so yes yeah so uh, let me go in and and spell out what what williamsburg is and then i'll tell you why i want to tell you about it so Williamsburg was the capital of the Virginia colony. Okay. Yep. And it began, so the Virginia colony, in fact, all of the colonies, as we know, began uh, with um, Jamestown. Jamestown, Virginia. You, and you, you're familiar with that and like how that ties into John Smith and all that sort of stuff in the Susquehanna mystery. Mm-hmm. So, as history tells us, and I'm, you know, I'm very particular or very specific when I say that. As history tells us, that's all we know is what they told us. Um, it began with Jamestown, and then Jamestown was the capital of the uh, of the colony of Virginia, and then at some point it moved over to Williamsburg, about ten miles away. So they're in the same general area. Virginia or Williamsburg was the capital. William and Mary College was founded in there. It was the second oldest college in, in the United States. 
uh, one of a handful of colleges founded during the colonial period. Harvard, I believe, holds the title of being the oldest. Um, and uh, it was it was a very well-to-do town. And then in the, I want to say like the early 1700s, the capital moved from Williamsburg to to um, to Richmond, and then Williamsburg remained really had just like two main industries, if you will. It continued being a college town, obviously for William and Mary, and then also a I believe it's the oldest, it's a, at least the oldest state-run mental hospital in the colonies was established mm. there. So you've got like, uh, uh, they called them the lazies and the crazies. <laughs> so, uh, so that was Williamsburg and that's kind of how, what Williamsburg had become since the capital and as the seat of power moved from Williamsburg in the early 1700s to, to Richmond and Williamsburg just was this other sort of like smaller town and kind of fell into, I don't want to say disrepair, but a lot of like the old colonial buildings, the old governor's palace, all of those sort of things, they just kind of fell to the wayside. So then colonial Williamsburg, um, now this is different. So when I say colonial Williamsburg, I'm saying with a capital C and a capital W. Colonial Williamsburg is what you saw commercials for. Mm -hmm. And colonial Williamsburg is considered what they would call a living museum. Right. And what a living museum is just like what you're saying. It's like you, it's it's you walk around, you walk around this village. And so I don't know how big colonial Williamsburg is. Let's say I think there are 200 buildings. So however big that would be, let's say like around the size of a small college campus, that's about the size of Colonial Williamsburg, which is inside the, the municipality, which is known as Williamsburg, the city. And it's this living museum, and they have all of these homes which are and buildings which are in immaculate condition, exactly as they were in colonial times. And you have people who are dressed in colonial attire. And they are experts within um, their field of history, and you could ask them questions. And you also have like a lot of people doing um, real colonial trades. You get to watch them, and you get to ask them questions, and they dress like the colonial people. So they'd be like blacksmiths and cobblers and, and people like that. And you could buy their goods, or but the majority, I think, of purchases by these people who practice the, their art form in the way that it was supposedly done in the colonial times, like they just sell them to other museums, any place that wants like an authentic replica of whatever it is they're purchasing. And you also have some people uh, who are in colonial Williamsburg who are specific individuals. Like there's this one guy who's always Thomas Jefferson. And I think he's been doing this for like 50 years. And like he dresses as Thomas Jefferson and he puts on performances and you can ask him questions. And he's always Thomas Jefferson. He never loses character. Um, so that's Colonial Williamsburg. And I kind of knew that. Like I think I went to Colonial Williamsburg once as a child. You know, I'll be turning 50 this year. So this was like 45 years ago. So how, how it would have been the last time I was there? I don't know how good my memory would be. I just know that I went there and it, you know, it was a, uh, more so a mental marker memory as opposed to like, I remember doing this and I remember doing that. I just know that I went there. I don't think it was anything particularly significant to me as a child. It's anything kind of boring. So I'm going down there. And the reason why we went down there is Jenny had like a family sort of thing, like kind of like a family reunion. And that's where Every, where it was taking place. It was like a midpoint from a whole bunch of different people. And I was super excited to go down there because uh, what I was really excited for was, um, was Jamestown because Jamestown holds such a, uh, um, such a, such a um, important part of the Susquehanna mystery. And, and it is important to me to go and actually put feet on the street on the ground. And I haven't been to Jamestown before. So I'm thinking about, I'm going to go to Jamestown. That was going to be the last day of our trip. We're going to go to Jamestown, but the first couple of days we're going to be in, in Williamsburg. I had no idea of the history of Williamsburg prior to going down there. And so I was, um, 
both delighted and not surprised when I discovered when I first walked in, when I first walked in, and I'm looking at this, and whenever whenever you see something which is which is like done really well, uh, particularly museums like the Smithsonian or like you know any of the ones in New York City, every city has like really good mu- museums. Like these are the official stories of how we're supposed to understand reality. Um, and so I, I kind of knew Williamsburg was going to be that, but I didn't have anything much more to think of. But I have that lens, and I walk into, like, the main entrance. And Williamsburg is free to anyone who goes there. You have to pay money to go into any of the the the, the structures, but you can walk around this, this colonial Williamsburg College campus for free. Um, as you know, there are no free lunches. But when you first get there to the welcoming center, and so it's a beautiful building, you know, tens of millions of dollars to construct, like, you know, done very well. Uh, You walk up and there is a wall of philanthropy. And to me, these are always the most interesting things when looking at one of these uh, foundations or or institutions, which are for for the most part public, you know, those that that are free. You want to go and see, well, who's really paying for this? (laughs) <laughs> because they're the ones who get to dictate. And who's so writing the look check? The, who's writing the check? So I was very, very, I was very, I did not know this until I saw this wall of philanthropy. This is a 100% John D. Rockefeller Jr. Uh, funded experience. Wow. So all roads lead to Rockefeller, particularly. So I want to say this began this began in the 1920s is when, when Colonial Williamsburg began a thing. So the Rockefellers, like, you know, that name is kind of like thrown out, is thrown out a lot. I do it myself. Like, you know, you just use it as like a general, a general uh, word, but there are different generations and different people did different things, you know, beginning with John Rockefeller uh, senior and then John Rockefeller junior and then David Rockefeller and like, you know, his brothers and all of that. So John D Rockefeller junior, he's the, he is the son of the primary Rockefeller that started, you know, on paper, at least this, this powerful, this powerful, uh, family, this very wealthy family. So John Jr. is born into the money, and so he's raised. He's raised, you know, to do whatever he is to do. And you go and you look at the things that are associated with John D. Rockefeller Jr. This is the guy who's behind, like, the United Nations, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the American Medical Association, uh, which... Uh, you know, all of the things when you hear about like the Rockefeller uh, eugenics programs of the early 1900s, like that, that was all John D. Rockefeller Jr. stuff. This is all stuff done underneath the guys um, funded either directly or indirectly from the Rockefeller Foundation. And so we can go and look. And the reason I bring up all uh, the reason I bring up all these details about other projects which John D. Rockefeller Jr. had funded, you get an understanding of what was important to him. You know, you just kind of follow the money. What are the things that he built? And then you go and you look at the world, and you're like, how influential is it? So it's like, how influential is the UN? How influential is, is the Council on Foreign Relations? How influential is the American Medical Association? All these sort of things. You could see they're very, very significant in shaping our reality. And so when I see that Colonial Williamsburg was one of was was one of John D. Rockefeller's projects, like a big project. You know, you have to go and reverse engineer that, like, you know, this is on that level of significance the, in terms of the same level as, like, Council and Foreign Relations and the UN, like, in terms of it may not be as big as those, but this guy doesn't play small. So this has to be, there, there, there's more there. There's more to this story. Now, at least that's what, what you know, where the angle which I am coming at it with. And then I start looking around. I'm like, well, what the hell is this? You know, at first, I'm not thinking anything really about what Williamsburg is. You know, when I was going to go down there, I was thinking about I want to go to Jamestown. 
And then I'd see it's John D. Rockefeller. I do, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm kind of hooked and I'm looking at things very, very different. I'm like, what am I experiencing? What am I witnessing? So it turns out that, that Colonial Williamsburg, well, well, there are two things. So, so when John D. Rockefeller gets involved, the Colonial Williamsburg, all of these old buildings, they are in disrepair. They're in ruin. Okay. And so everything which you see now, this beautiful, this beautiful reproduction of colonial times, it's, for the most part, it's all made up. Now, how far we say it's all made up, you know, we don't exactly know. But we do know that this is not accurate. I started asking a whole bunch of questions. I'm like, you know, I was driving people nuts, like asking them all these questions, but I was fascinated. I wanted to know, I'm like, so when I see this house right here, did this house actually exist? Like, well, no, well, it didn't really. And I'm like, well, how do you know what was inside it? You know, how do you know this? Well, you know, we can look at these references and this and that, and the rest of it is just kind of like a, 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 the best guess that we have. You know, we, we kind of know that that's what this is. Right. All of the buildings, like, you know, when you'd see like the, the beautiful reproduction of the um, of the governor's palace, They're like, well, this isn't exactly on the same foundation. You know, the, we, the found, there were I think they said out of the 200 buildings, there were 88 that were based upon or on actual buildings that existed there. And then the other ones they just like invented. Um, and then to the degree of those 88, which were supposedly real buildings like you know they've all been modified we don't really know what they looked at so we've got that going on and then you go a little bit deeper into colonial williamsburg and colonial williamsburg was the first they invented this whole idea of um uh, living history, uh, living museums, like where someone goes in and they have this experience. I'm a regular contemporary person. I'm taking my family down to go see Colonial Williamsburg and we step back in the history. You know, that's mm. what's happening. Right. Um, this is an ARG. Like this is literally what an ARG <laughs> is. They're not calling it that, but it works from the same mentality. It is fully engrossing everything around uh, you, like, uh, feedback loops to say like, this is what happened. This is what happened. You're experiencing it. Like you don't even question, you don't even question anything. You're like, well, obviously this is what it was because look how real this is. Like, look how much time and how much thought went into this. Well, I also know that the guy who funded this is very, very interested in, um, shaping the future. And I think he's also very interested in shaping what the past was. So now I'm like looking at all this and I've asked, I was asking people questions and um, realizing they don't know anything. They don't know anything. Like when, if you ask, they know very well, like what they've been taught, but when you begin to go and ask how far back it goes, like it all falls apart. They just don't know. So I'm not necessarily saying there was no Williamsburg. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying like, I'm on the most literal ex description. This is a false reality, a false reality of what history was. And people come from all over, like it's a huge parking lot. Like if you go, go and see the parking lot that goes there, I don't know how many visitors they get in in a particular year so then i i i see that i'm witnessing the whole thing i'm kind of like in awe in in how well it's done looking at who are all the other benefactors who are the other people who put in a lot of money the other per the person who probably comes second on the list who's contributed the most amount of money is a guy by the name of wallace dewitt i think i'm pronouncing his name correctly um that's he made his that's strange because uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, Mike, but there's a comedian that I listened to named Andrew DeWitt, who's from uh, either North Carolina or Virginia, and his father is the inventor of the Stain Master. The Stain Master? So I don't know if the What's DeWitt. The stain Master? It's like a carpet cleaner. Ah, yeah. Stain Master. Stain, stain, stain master. master. I yeah, don't yeah. know. I don't know. Yeah, okay. and, and it's just interesting, the, the proximity, this DeWitt name in that region. Certainly. So this DeWitt guy, though, he's not that guy. They may be related. I don't know. This is the guy who um, made all of his money. He is the uh, – he is the – 
I get, I don't know if founder is the right word. He started Reader's Digest. You know what Reader's Digest is? Yeah, they like the they find it's like an editorial. They find things that they think people would like to read, and they kind of compile it. They used to you can find in like used bookstores. They used to sell hardcover Reader's Digest, and it would be like a collection of novellas or short stories, right? Well, well, yes, and a lot of what they would do is they would do condensed versions. Mm, okay, like almost like a Cliff Notes version. Like, right. it's an easier read. You're not going to sit down and read these 800 pages, but I'm going to give you 12 pages. Right. So it's like, you know, uh, Lost Paradise Lost by John Milton, but, you know, condensed. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of like creating a false reality of what that original work is. Mm, like, right. I'm not saying like, I, but I'm saying it's the same, it's the same general motif. Mm -hmm. So we go and we see all that. And, and so I'm like, okay, this is, and the reason I'm bringing this up now is because we're talking about false realities. Like I talked about it from a technological aspect, but now we're talking a little bit about it on a softer aspect in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, like understanding our history, understanding our history. And particularly, you know, we were talking all about like those walls, those roads, you know, that's not part of Williamsburg. That's not part of the history, which we're given. We're given this other history. We're given this other way of understanding our past. So I'm there. I'm, I'm looking at that. I'm kind of amazed uh, looking at pictures of Walt Disney who came and really studied Williamsburg before he built his first Disneyland experience to understand, you know, ideas of how to create false realities. Right. So, you know, you could see the how this 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 um, technique has been used over and over again. I mean, particularly if you go and you look, if you look at like it's not true for everyone, but there are quite a few adults, full adults who are still like Disney crazy. Right. They go down every year. It's their vacation. You're like, wow, you're a full grown adult. Why are you so like hooked into Disney? Mm. Well, the reason you're so hooked into Disney is because Disney is that powerful of a psychological uh, anchor to certain periods of one's life. Like the reason why you would be an adult and still be really into Disney is because there's some, there's some sort of link there. Like it satisfies a certain itch, it keeps you connected to a certain time period. Um, there's that. And then there's also all the other hypnotic sort of stuff, which goes along with it. But, but nonetheless, I don't want to get, I don't want to get too far off, off where I'm going with the story. So probably the only the weirdest thing that happened, like everything I'm just, I just described to you, I, don't, I think was kind of devoid of any sort of like mystical or, or synchronistic sort of thing happening other than the fact that, you know, I was kind of called down there. But one of the things which they have in colonial Williamsburg was um, they have, uh, they have open archaeology. I don't know if they call it open archaeology. They call it something else. But basically, they're doing archaeology there. They're doing archaeology there. And um, you can go and, and talk to the archaeologists and sit, they'll tell you like what they're looking for and what they found. And you can see what an archaeological dig looks like and so forth. So we walked over to that and they were... They were, they were looking for something which, you know, wasn't too exciting. I don't even remember what it was, but I started a conversation. There were four archaeologists there working. You know, I don't know how many, how many professional archaeologists there would be. I can't imagine. I would imagine if you decide to go and study archaeology, like to actually have a gig where you pay, you're paid to go and do that for your living, like that's a pretty good, a pretty good place to be. I, that's my assumption. I don't know. Maybe every archaeologist gets to do it. But it's a small group that gets to get there, uh, that gets to do this. And so there are only so many archaeologists that get to work at Williamsburg. And then um, from there, there are only going to be so many people who are going to be there when I happen to cross that path of, of the open archaeology. And then of the four people that were there, there were two that I spoke to. Um, they were probably, I would say, like in their 30s, and both of them were from Lancaster. And they weren't both from Lancaster. One was from Millersville, went to school at Millersville, you know, this is where I live. 
which is, I don't think is particularly well known for its archaeology program. And then the other person went to Elizabethtown College. And Elizabethtown College, if you if you remember that map which I have, which shows High Point yep. in the center of the four colleges, Elizabethtown is one of those colleges. Wow. So, so the odds, you know, if you just want to go and do the odds of like, you know, me, uh, of me going down, meeting archaeologists, I don't know if I've ever met an archaeologist before, holding a conversation at a place which is really kind of meaningful for me, and then to see that they're both from two very meaningful places. One, one of the colleges, which, which I've talked about, um, well, actually both colleges I've talked about extensively for different reasons. And so that was kind of, uh, that to me was a good um, indicator of of being at the right place at the right time, and then the last thing I want to say about Williamsburg before I mention Jamestown is that what I did discover was in the 30s. You know Manly P. Hall, correct? Of course. Well, his wife was convinced that buried beneath Colonial Williamsburg was a vault. And in that vault had information from Francis Bacon, uh, including the conclusion of the New Atlantis, uh, information back to ancient Egypt and all sorts of other like kind of like real mystical sort of stuff. And then back in the 1990s, there was a renewed interest in the same theory and idea. And um, two different times, people tried to go and excavate where they think this vault is. It's called, I think it's called the, the Burton Vault, B-U-R-T-O-N, the Burton Vault. There have been quite a few books written about this mysterious vault, which is underneath uh, which has been buried beneath Colonial Williamsburg, which also to me might be an indication of why Rockefeller could have been interested in the location. Mm. Is like maybe maybe there's something going on with that. Nonetheless, that story s- seemingly has a dead end. You know, I don't know if there's anything to it. It could have just been you know smoke and mirrors, or maybe there's something to it. But I wanted to add that to the mix. And add to the mix that Colonial Williamsburg has a pretty complex underground tunnel system. (laughs) And so whether or not that ties into it, I don't know. So now I'm going to tell you this one last part, and then I'll stop talking for a bit and and, and hear what your thoughts are. Uh, On the very last day, I go down to Jamestown. And Jamestown is not related to, to the Williamsburg colonial Williamsburg directly, but they're so complimentary and they're so close that, that they're kind of separate or they're kind of on par, excuse me, they're parallel to one another. And they also have a big museum, a big fancy museum. And they also have this, like you get to walk through a uh, reenactment of Fort James, what it was originally called and like the, the, the Powhatan village, which was around there and replicas of the boats, which crossed the Atlantic. But they also had a uh, very, very well done museum covering uh, um, Jamestown, probably, I don't know, like 3,000, 4,000 square feet of just exhibits. Like it's a, it's a good size, um, top notch museum, interactive with like really, really good, uh, um, you know, displays, museum displays, whatever you call those. But what I found most interesting there was not what they had, but what they did not have. They did not have a single instance where they showed the John Smith map of Virginia, which holds a great degree of um, both historical significance, but ties in directly to Jamestown. They did show pieces of the map, but they never showed the map in its entirety. They would, they would have like large, large blow ups of just one little image from the map that I recognize, uh, though the map was not named. Uh, there was one small section on John Smith, but then the other thing which they omitted was any connection to Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon, I mean, just is, is one, he's a very significant historical figure, but two, it's just part of like regular history, Francis Bacon's uh, connection to Jamestown. He was, he, he was on their, their board of directors. They called the executive council. He wrote their two charters. He presented on their uh, on their behalf to Parliament. And because Francis Bacon is such a significant um, 
part of history, it would just make sense that there has to be at least some sort of mention to Francis Bacon within um, this enormous museum gone to Jamestown. Yet there was no mention of him, nor there was no reference to the John Smith map of Virginia. And so typically, you know, one of the best ways of, of controlling the story is not necessarily uh, lies being told, but truths that have been omitted. Mm. Yeah. So that's my Jamestown Williamsburg story of seeing like another level of reality of how another part of how reality is shaped in this seemingly benign, like historical context, but then also like it, it, everywhere you turn around, you could see these are all these, these stories, these false stories given to the masses on how they are to understand their history uh, their experience, what to look at and what not to look at. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, as you're telling me this story, I'm kind of just looking through the Wikipedia and, you know, not only are the Rockefellers involved, but in Jamestown, I, I think the president of a 300 year old church, it had its 300 year anniversary in 1907 around the time when they were kind of conceiving all this was J.P. Morgan. So he was yeah. involved. And then um, and then another person who was involved is, uh, sorry, um, the Anheuser-Busch family. And they created Busch Gardens Williamsburg, which I'm sure people have seen before. Isn't that like... Uh, Kind of like a zoo, a theme park type thing. Bush Gardens. It's a, it's a theme. Yeah, Bush Gardens uh, is is a theme park, and Bush Gardens Williamsburg is probably like fifteen minutes away. You're you're absolutely right. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> Anheuser Bush. I want to say they're out of St. Louis, correct? Right. And so whenever I hear St. Louis, like you know, obviously you're going to think about the mounds there and like the arch and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I don't remember. I remember once I was trying to look and see if the Bush family, the the presidential family, the Prescott Bush family line, if they were connected. I don't believe that they were. No, At least I but they, find any they're confirmation. They're they're sort of loosely connected to the Pfizer company. Yes, I and, thought it was Lilly. It's Lilly, isn't it? Is it Lilly or Pfizer? It's one of the big pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, it's saying here Pfeiffer, but I don't know if that's the same. You know, it could just be a similar name. But, yeah, they're, they're royalty from Germany, and, and we both know that a lot of that German royalty made its way into the British royalty, and they're well, very much the incestuous. House, the House of Windsor, that's all German. Right. That's the Saxe-Gotha line, right? Right. But yeah, it's it's certainly uh, an interesting area. The other thing that I noticed that was strange is that Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg, was built in 1699, and then uh, the you know reenacted Williamsburg became a on the National Historic Places list or registry wow. in 1966. That uh, kind of reversed there. 1699 in the 66. Yeah. Um, there, there's there's a lot going on there. The um, the two things which I want to point out, uh, and I appreciate you bringing this, bringing this up, is um, you talked about the 1907 300 anniversary of Williamsburg and J.P. Morgan, and there was a world exposition that was held in Jamestown, right at that point. Um, and so, if you're familiar with Howdy's uh, work. And his take on world expositions and world fairs and what they did, you know, one questioning like, you know, how did they build all the stuff? And then two, recognizing that the expositions were primarily um, uh, tools to give the intelligentsia class, the, you know, the upper middle class of America or, or wherever these world expositions, because that's who's going to be able to afford to come to them. Um, it would give them a narrative and a storyline for how to understand history and how to see the future. It did two things. They would reenact the past and they would paint a certain picture. And then they would also say, this is what the future is going to look like. 
And in a lot of ways, that's the same thing in which we're seeing with Colonial Williamsburg. Um, but we see that, that that was in 1907. Um, and then on the 400th anniversary of Jamestown, which happened in 2007, uh, if you go and you look with, on May 14th, which is when that took place, there was a big, uh, a big to do down in Jamestown and Queen Elizabeth II was there. The Bushes were there, but not Anheuser Bush Bushes, George Bush Senior, and so forth. But it had all of these muckety mucks there, and so like uh, I didn't realize that Anheuser Bush was involved with with the 1907 Jamestown thing, but uh, it certainly supports this this renewed interest or this continued interest of of powerful families, particularly those that are connected to some degree of, of, of monarchy um, wanting to go back to this land. Mm. Well, it's, uh, it's a part of the new Atlantis. I mean, really, it, it just seems like they, they have a, this secret game plan and, and they all follow the roles that were crafted. I mean, when I think Williamsburg, I think of, you know, and then I think of Francis Bacon, it makes me think of, you know, the whole, well, Francis Bacon was William Shakespeare thing. Um, but it seems like the, the town Williamsburg or the, the colony Williamsburg was named after uh, William the Third or, or the William of Orange, uh, one of the kings of England. He was also... Uh, royalty in in the Dutch with the Dutch as well. I don't know what the history is there, but my mind brought me to Shakespeare. But it's it's William the Third. But I mean, how do we know that Francis Bacon isn't Shakespeare? And what if he was inspired to write about certain things he saw in Williamsburg in the Shakespeare stories? Well, there, you, you bring up uh, an interesting point, like, I, and I thought the same thing. I'm like, well, who is the William for Williamsburg? And and the the primary story is just what you said that it was King William, who I believe was the sitting monarch at the establish when Williamsburg was established. I think that is it, and that's why it's like William and Mary as well. Um, but then you're also right, like, you know, if you, you know your history and you understand everything which goes on with, like, the, the innuendo with, with William Shakespeare, uh, William Shakespeare, without a doubt, is, if you want to look at the United Kingdom and their exports to culture and the world, William Shakespeare has to be much more profound than, than King William, and whether William Shakespeare be... Uh, Francis Bacon or or not though I I've, I'm comfortable with the conclusion that if it's not directly um, Francis Bacon who wrote all of those he was he had his hand involved with a lot of the writing so mm. cool. yeah I, it's 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 uh, and when you then tie in that's part of like why Manly P. Hall's wife, I think her name was Marie Bauer, you know, talk about like powerful German names, Bauer being yeah. um, the, the, the Rothschild original name. Um, she was saying like all of her, all of the reason why she came to that conclusion, uh, and I believe that that if you look into the history of the Burton vault and, and uh, um, Mary Bauer, she said that she was given this information from someone else, but it's all of these crypts and ciphers that connect to Shakespeare's work and ciphers that were on some of the gravestones of this one particular church in Colonial Williamsburg. Um, but it ties into Francis Bacon. Mm. Now, another story that comes from this area that might be more tangible or more fictional, at least, is the... The Sus, uh, the, sorry, not Susquehanna, the Pocahontas story. She was um, a daughter of one of the Powhatan peoples that lived along the James River. And when Jamestown was 
created, they had a lot of clashes. And then as people know, if you're familiar with the Pocahontas story, um, the colonist John marries Pocahontas and, you know, lives with them for a certain amount of time. And then the, I don't know if this is what happens in the movie Pocahontas, but history has that the Powhatan people, you know, massacred a bunch of colonists or, you know, they, they were killed, a bunch of Indians were killed, and then they came back and killed a bunch of settlers. And that caused people to abandon Jamestown uh, for some time until the governor of the United Kingdom of England and the Earl of Southampton, they decided they were planning to win the forest back, you know, so this, uh, then they went back and, and fought for, for this palisade from the Powhatan people. Have you heard about this, Mike? The Powhatan tribe? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm very familiar with, with, um, I mean, I'm familiar with the stories that they tell us. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> you know, right. that's, that's what, what the familiar goes. And like the, I've always thought, um, the Pocahontas story is, 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 I think really, I, I've put a lot of, um, awareness to that, particularly because of its, it's, most people know that story through a Disney lens. Right. And there's like uh, there's also like a mainstream history lens which talks about it as well. But whether you want to look at it from the mainstream history or the the Disney history, like you know, it, there, there's a lot of energy placed upon it. Um, I've always found Pocahontas as an interesting counterpoint to Virginia Dare, who is another young young woman girl who is tied to that part of the world in myth and in history and they kind of overlap um and you know what they represent uh virginia dare being the first english child born in the new world at the lost colony of, of roanoke And the story goes that she then was raised by the wilderness. You know, that's part of the mythology of Virginia Dare. But then when you counter that to um, the Pocahontas story, which she then marries, I think Edward Rolfe is the historical version. And then she goes to England. So you have someone who is indigenous to the land who then goes and becomes angelicized, you know, moves to England and becomes like society person. I think she lived in England for a year or two before she died, but there's kind of like a counterbalance between these stories of this English girl then going into the new world uh, and raised by the wilderness. And then this like indigenous person then going into England and becoming part of the English. Like there's a, there's a weaving of, of female uh, symbology there. I found that interesting. And then also when you just look at it in terms of the Disney aspect, um, I don't think I've ever seen the Disney cartoon, but I'm, I've researched it. And what has always been interesting to me or the most interesting thing about it was it was the 33rd featured animation released by Walt Disney Productions or whatever the business name is of um of uh um for the disney corporation and you know 33 like oh wow that's kind of cool to begin with uh but we know that 33 is a significant number within the disney world why do we know that because they have the 33 club which is found i think in three different um three different Disney amusement parks and, you know, mm. cost like a hundred thousand dollars to join. And particularly the one that's out in Los Angeles and uh, overlaps very much with the Hollywood industry. And it's like, you know, a real fancy sort of place, you know, and an exclusive to be a member of. So we know 33 is significant. Um, and then if you were to go and just think about the logistics of running a business, like if the primary export of or product of the Disney 
film company is releasing movies and their bread and butter or what they're best known for are the Disney animated feature films. Like this is all planned in advance, like just from a regular basis. Like you know what movies you're working on, you know what's going to be released when, you've got schedules, you create like, you know, your your pro forma cash flow sheets and all that sort of stuff. So the fact that that Pocahontas was selected you know, for whatever reason, to be the 33rd release, a number which we know is important within the Disney organization. Mm. Uh, we know that Walt Disney himself has been to Colonial Williamsburg, and he studied it in parts of his understanding of creating uh, an environment like Disneyland. I'm like, yeah, there's there's a great deal of significance there. Yeah, yeah. She's a, a very interesting story. 21 years old is is how long she lived till, and she died in England. So yeah, it was. Uh, you're right. Thomas Rolf was who sort of Thomas, not Edward. Yeah, That's ma- close. married her. I'm and... usually close. I'm <laughs> close. I'm not always like bullseye, uh, but I'm you're, close. You're dead on most of the time. But it's interesting. The other point that they kind of make about her is is uh, Squanto who plays a big role in the whole Thanksgiving myth. He shares a very similar kind of fate to Pocahontas, albeit, you know, no colonists married him. He um, he was very adept at language, learned English, and became a diplomat between the Puritans and his tribe, the uh, Poha- Pohaka Het in uh, Cape Cod. And he, he basically got captured or kidnapped by the Spanish and then sold in Spain and ended up, I think, living the remainder of his life in England as well. But yeah, it's it's interesting that time period, you know, the myths that came from it. And then, yeah, 33, Disney helping, you know, reimagine for us, you know, creating our imagination of, of history and of life and of the world around us. And, and then you see like those, uh, I, w- w- syndromatic cases of like the Disney itis that like you mentioned, you know, it, it stays with certain people until they're adults and you're almost like, yeah, you got, haven't you outgrown this? It's like, well, it, I think that really just shows that it's a psychological hypnotic thing that's going on there and some people are more susceptible to it than others and if you go and i'm sure if you psychologically not that i believe too much in psychoanalysis but i'm sure you would find a theme if you analyzed uh that type of person who as an adult goes to disneyland uh, (laughs) without children (laughs) yeah (laughs) definitely so definitely so but so it's it's I, like propaganda, you know. They're like creating this worldview for people, and that's very comforting. And I think that's the response that some people have: is like, "Oh wow, I love this, I love the Disney World. How could I? Who, who wouldn't want to go and live there, uh, spend time there once a year?" Exactly. Exactly. Um. Have we covered everything on that for now? Like, is there more to go into that? As far as Williamsburg? uh, Williamsburg and Jamestown, I think we did that because I think we wanted to go over some some emails too, correct? Yeah, I I had one email that was interesting. And uh, another guy (laughs) who I kind of followed up with, he just, as we were talking, emailed me and said, oh, funny that you um, emailed me. I think I emailed him this morning. He says, I was just listening to a podcast with you and Michael Wan. And I'm like, well, uh, add another layer to the pot here. I'm on a podcast with Mike right now as you emailed me. Um, but, yeah, here we have one message from, uh, let's see. So... This gentleman, his name is, well, we have a quick question from somebody, and then we have a, kind of a, a longer form question. So the quick question All right, let's see the quick one first. for you is, um, I heard Michael Wan uh, on your podcast, and both of you have become a huge inspiration to open up the synchronous happenings in my own life. And I'm looking to start my own podcast as a way to find my tribe. 
so he asks, how did we get started with our podcast? For me, I guess I started a podcast. Mike, you kind of have a, you know, little bit of a different story. Maybe this is a long form question, but he, the quick question is, um, I heard Michael start talking about Biomancy. Does he still offer that service? I can't find it on his website. The, the, the answer is no for now. I might do that again, but I've, uh, I think I did like three years straight of working with people directly and um, I need to take a break. So I'm in a, a break phase for that right now, but I missed that. And so at some point I'll probably start doing that again. Right on. All right. And then the longer question is, uh, maybe we could, it is, more, go in, it's more than one paragraph. Finish? So maybe we should, so, I should send it to you and we'll talk about it next week. All right. Well, let's go back to like the question about the guy who wanted to create his own podcast. Um, cool, yeah. so I would, so I'd say this right here, what you and I are doing right now is the first like real podcast that I have participated in or have done like the other stuff I've done on YouTube, I would define that as something else. So to answer very quickly, the only reason this is happening is because of you Mark, because, um, I would never have done this myself. <laughs> you know, you've done a lot of the legwork in terms of like the technology. So I'm immensely grateful for that because otherwise I wouldn't have done that. So the answer to that guy is like, if you feel the, the, the impetus to go and start something like that's all it takes is just like the, the, the inertia to get it started. Mm. Um, but then secondly, as it related to what I did begin on my own was creating just YouTube video presentations. Um, and that was the same thing, which I just said about the podcast. Like, you know, you go in, um, if there's something which you feel you need to share or to say, to just go and do it. Um, and then to kind of keep at it. Uh, right. I, I created the first thing I did. Um, and this, this may have been like around 2017. I took all of this information, which I had done on, um, on the Susquehanna mystery. And all this was, was like pointing out the strange synchronicities and history associated with Susquehanna. I began by only doing in-person presentations and I was just doing it in my immediate area. And I would say I would get anywhere from five to maybe 40 people. And I do, I would do maybe like one every two months. And I had a variety of presentations. And after doing that for a year or two, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a lot. I enjoyed like seeing people's faces. I enjoyed the the interaction that happens when you you have a live audience and you can tell if they're asleep or if they're interested or what have you. Um, but I also realized that there was a very limited um, there was a limited audience for where I was, and it was kind of like a it's a hard sell. It was a hard sell to get people. Um, it was a hard sell to get people to come out of their house and trying to explain something like on a flyer and what have you. But um, I began that way. And then when I realized that this was kind of limited, I was like, well, let me create something um, which could be viewed, which can be viewed on the internet. And then I went and I figured out based upon um the limited number of, of applications and technological resources I had is like, well, what's the best way which I can go and tell this information? And so I then created um, a presentation. I did Secret of the Susquehanna Part 1, Secret of the Susquehanna Part 2, uh, I think for Mystic Lancaster, and I also did the 100-year timeline. So a total of probably... I'm going to say that's probably about three hours of material. And I, I wrote scripts. I, you know, I, I did it the best I could without knowing how to do anything. I wrote scripts. I got like some music, I edited it and I put those on a YouTube channel. And for probably like two years, they sat at like no more than like, 
150 views, 200 views maybe. Um, and then what I started doing, once I put that out there and I saw that really wasn't resonating, I didn't want to, like promoting things online and stuff like that just isn't my, my, my bag of tricks. Um, what I thought that I wanted to do or how to get a broader audience was I started, um, I wanted to go on existing podcasts as a guest and that way I could go and, and, and talk about my stuff. And so then what I did was I created uh, two one-page one um, flyers, for lack of a better re, uh, word, which were visually appealing and that would be able to touch upon key points so that I could send them to podcast hosts, podcasts that I had listened to, uh, which I had been a fan of, and just kind of like, hey, can I come on as a guest? And I probably sent out, I don't know, 30 different emails. Hey, my name is Mike, and this is what I've done, and attached our, you know, some interest, some, some uh, summary of my work, and here are links to a little bit more in depth information to the videos and like, can I come on as a guest? Would this be something you'd be interested in? And maybe about four or five of them uh, responded yes. And that's kind of what started my journey. Yeah. Wow. Right on. And people who haven't seen that content uh, and who maybe are like me and, and, and prefer the audio style, even though you did put a lot of work into those presentations. So I, it is, it is, worthwhile to check them out sit down and watch them but if you're like me and you like audio and you can you can use your imagination and maybe go back and see it we put all of those um presentations that you described doing initially in this podcast feed so people can check that out right here but wow yeah i didn't know um most of that myself mike so i'm glad we got that question that was the, the story and so i uh, the point which you just made, we have the audio only of those presentations on this feed. Uh, I took down those videos. Those videos aren't available anywhere else. So like the only place you're going to hear that information is, uh, is right here on this podcast right on, on the feed at least. Right. Or, uh, if they subscribe on subscribe star too, right. Do you have the <laughs> videos there? If not, I think that would be, uh, cool too because the vi the the visual side of those presentations is like I said worthwhile uh, but you know we want to we want to incentivize people to show you some support as well so yeah if they're so, not on subscribe star maybe put them there I should probably do that I do such a I do a half ass effort <laughs> an admitted half ass effort at all of that and it's not because it's it's not because I think it's it's worthy of a half ass effort. It's just that it's hard for me to really. Um, I don't I, I don't like our model. I don't like the model which our, our reality is in right now. I don't want to have everything about it, and so that is always where my I don't do a great job on subscribe. So anyone who is I think there are about fifty people right now that are active subscribers. It was up higher when I was like more, <coughs> excuse me, more actively putting stuff up, but I just shy away from it sometimes. I'm like, I just don't want to interact that way. But you know, that's more of no, like I, my, I, <laughs> that's my issue. That is, that's no one else's. No, I'm just, you know, you're, you're not alone. You're not I'm alone. I'm just being I, transparent. I, I definitely have that same hesitation. I think it, it's, it's not easy to go and like promote yourself on social media when, uh, especially when you're like looking into such deep stuff. I think the people who are good at promoting themselves, uh, often the case, unfortunately, is they have less uh, to say and less to share. Well, not not to slight it, anybody, but it's just that's a whole nother skill set. Knowing how it's to a whole nother yourself. skill set. You're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I mean this. It's part of the compartmentalization of how our system is set up. Like, and I, I always say this about this is a parallel. This isn't the same, but. But uh, in the political system, like a politician, what is a politician's skill set? They know how to get elected. 
That doesn't mean, like, if you believe in the political system, like, I'm going to talk to someone who believes in that way. Like, the politician has nothing to do with, like, writing laws or anything like that. What their skill set is is getting elected, you know, the, the lobbyists or the what have you. Like, they do the other things. But it's, it's like, how we have it set up. Like, you're, you are absolutely right. Like, there are some people who are really good and are interested in those sort of things. Um, and sometimes they're also very good at creating content, but for the most part, they're different skill sets and compartmentalized. And so they go, uh, they, they, you, you do need a, a, a team with that. So well, nonetheless, I'll go, go on. I, I wanted to, to, to say too, like I really enjoy this style of uh podcast that you and I are doing where you know we have a, an established connection we've known each other and now we're, we're proceeding to kind of conversate each week and pick up the ball and see where it lands and uh, you know to the question of our listener shout out to you thank you for writing us uh, I, I say this to people all the time I just actually pulled up a text message that I sent uh, my best friend's older brother I've known my friend Matt since middle school and he was the first guest on my podcast and him and his brother do a lot of content around video games and i told him i'm like a video game podcast just beat joe rogan as number one on spotify why don't you have a podcast yet and then he's kind of like oh well what will we do and i said well you know this is my advice to him but this applies to really anybody it's like don't underestimate the feeling of being a fly on the wall that's what so many people are drawn to podcasts for and i think a lot of people waste uh time trying to wrap their head around what they're going to talk about when they should just hit record and start talking so my advice to people who are you know emailing and saying like oh i want to start my own podcast is just do it and if you're not happy with the first three or four episodes you know, that's fine. You know, I'm reminded uh, of something you spoke to Chance Garten about on the Interverse podcast. Tara and I were listening to that conversation while we were on that drive I described at the beginning of this conversation. You talked about the, the Tao of creativity. And, and one of the things that was really cool that you said, Mike, was like, you know, I grew up in a, a household where I was always being challenged. And that made me, you know, it sharpened me. But at the same time, it, it made me want to uh, not have to be scrutinized to that degree. So instead of being like, you know, the apprentice of a painter and learning the, all the things that, be, you know, encompass being a painter, you invented your own art. Because when you invent your own style, who's going to tell you you're wrong? You know, that's, I'm paraphrasing, but in other words... That's, was your point and I think that's the same thing with podcasting it's, this is an art and you're never going to really know who's going to appreciate you until you put it out there uh, and let people uh, give it a listen because audio is just waiting to be heard it wants to be heard and uh, and yeah so to, to you uh, listening right now if you want to start a podcast you can go to altmediaunited.com click that button that says join and you can book a 15-minute meeting with me, and I can give you maybe some uh, pointers and put you in the right direction. That's something I just started uh, this week. I have a, a calendar up there, and folks who are interested can can book me for like a little mini consultation. And if you already have a podcast, and uh, that's basically your way of joining the cooperative. So uh, I want to comment on that, and I'll speak this to anyone who's listening who's interested in starting uh, their own podcast. Uh, you're a great – you are um, – you are – you, Mark. Mark is a great reference. If you literally go and you follow Mark's biography or his experience within this, within this space and, like, who you work with, understanding everything from – uh, the every part of the technological aspect, let's say if you want to create a business model aspect, uh, then the actual like what it takes to be a host aspect, what it takes to to interview someone to like manage other people's schedules. Like, I don't think there's really anyone who has as much experience and seen so many other different ways. You work with so many different people that, um, you are a huge resource. So anyone who is interested, if you, if you, Mark, have made your time 
available for someone who is interested in doing that, you'd be foolish. I would tell this now to the listener who's interested, you'd be foolish not to take them up on that opportunity. Right. It is only 15 minutes, but I will be generous <laughs> with my time. I don't want to charge people for that because it's a cooperative and I feel like there's much more uh, opportunity in between to, for everyone to make money. But thank you, Mike. I really appreciate you saying that. That's very nice of you. Um, well, you're welcome. And you're welcome. I, I think this was another good two hours. And this is what I love about what we're doing is I try, I've always wanted to do an audio only podcast. But the problem was like the idea of just like sitting and talking, um, it was unappealing to me. The reason why I was able to do the presentation by myself was unappealing or, or not even so much unappealing. I wasn't able to do it. It just never worked. I was able to do presentations on like YouTube because I'd create a bunch of slides and I would talk about that and there'd be the visual element, but I've always wanted to do this. And so I know for me, like this could only happen because I've got this other person to play with, to play off of. And so this is, this is, this is fantastic for me. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for all the folks that listen to this and particularly the folks that decide to write in and ask questions. So next week we'll begin maybe with that, with the, uh, um, with the long form question that we got uh, this last time and maybe if any other questions come in. Yeah. Yeah. I want to uh, give that person a shout out, shout out to bill. We will get to your question next week and uh, shout out to Amor day who asked that first question about the podcast. And yeah, please folks, you can email me at MFTIC podcast at gmail.com. Like I said, go to altmediaunited.com if you're really interested in getting the ball rolling. And then if you want to uh, be heard on this podcast, we have a fun way that you can participate in the show. And Mike and I will actually be able to respond to your comments in real time. Go to pod Box.com slash capital M F T I C. Click on the Your Handbook for the Apocalypse voicemail box and leave us a voice message. And I'll play it for Mike. He'll hear it for the first time and we'll respond to your message. But with that, Mike, thank you uh, for joining me on another episode of Your Handbook for the Apocalypse. And thank you for listening. You know where to subscribe. If you're listening on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast feed, go over to Susquehanna Alchemy. Like we said, all of Mike's audio presentations are also there and more will be uploaded soon, including this episode of Your Handbook for the Apocalypse. And a little update on our great blue heron friend. We have not re-released him into the wild yet, so that also maybe we'll have uh, more updates Keep us on, posted that, on that next week. Our friend Sassafras. <laughs> And one last thing, because when is this going to be released? So today is the, what, the 21st? Is today the 21st? Today's the 20th, and it should be yeah, out by the 21st. So, okay, so on the 31st, so, like, if anyone listens to in that next, in the next 10 days of this release, or the, the 10 days of it being released, on the 31st, I'm doing a live presentation in, um, in New Cumberland, talk about consciousness, reality, and then specifically the Susquehanna River. Uh, and let's include a link to that in the show, uh, in the show notes for this, because if you're in the area and if you could make it, I'd love to see anyone out there. Right on. Yeah. And I, guarantee that tara and i will be there uh it's not a far drive for us so we'll be there too all right <laughs> i can't wait right on all right mike well thank you again and thank you for listening enjoy the moment wherever you are in the now